Hello, welcome to Catholic News World. We are here today in Barry's Bay, Ontario, Canada, welcoming the new president of Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College, Dr. Williams, who will tell us a little bit about Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College and why you should send your children here. Welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming to visit us here and uh, to see what the college is all about and so we can reach out to your audience and your listeners. Uh, Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College is one of those hidden gems in North America. Um, it's, a, it's a Catholic college, uh, faithful to the magisterium. It's uh, regarded as, a, as a quite a good school by the Newman Guide. And some of the history is quite interesting. What happened about 20 years ago is a group of parents and professors who were themselves parents got together and they realized that uh, in this area and in general education um, need, needed a boost, needed to focus on, on things that are more appropriate to human flourishing. And they realized that college prices were, were getting very high. Uh, parents couldn't afford to send their students to colleges that they wanted. And the result of that was Our Lady Seat of Wisdom. At the time, it was an academy, but they got together. They decided to form a school whose principles would be quite simple. One, it needed to be faithful to the Catholic faith and to the magisterium. Two, it needed to actually educate students, not just train them for something. And three, it needed to be affordable so that anybody who wanted to get this kind of education could do so. Now, they took the, the name Our Lady Seat of Wisdom because they felt very called being in the Berries Bay area, which is, has a special devotion to Our Lady, Our Lady of Combamir. Uh, there's the Madonna House, which is such a very strong influence on the community. They felt very called to ask Our Lady for guidance in this. And 20 years later, they're still thriving and flourishing. They've grown beyond the state of an academy. They're now a college. Um, and their focus is the, the liberal arts in their truest form, not what they've become today in most, uh, most modern colleges, um, some of which are even Catholic, but uh, what they truly were meant to be, liberal arts, liberating the mind and the soul so that people could flourish, uh, and, and pursue whatever vocation that the Lord had made them to pursue. One of the most interesting features that I have found since coming here is the level of high quality professors and students that attend the school. Our professors are world-renowned scholars who have decided to spend their lives here educating young adults. Now that's a much bigger prospect than, uh, than some people may think because our, our professors, all of whom could get tenured, well-paying positions at other, at other universities, have chosen to work at a school whose price is going to remain low for the sake of education and to take those challenges as part of their vocation as teachers. Um, it's really an impressive community and the fact that it's been here for 20 years in uh, a town of 1500 really indicates that Our Lady has guided it to where it is. Wonderful! And the college has recently lost their president, um, Dr. Cassidy, and yes. you're replacing him and they're so happy to have you here, Dr. Williams, with your beautiful family. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, um, I was born in St. Louis, but I immediately moved to Texas. So, uh, as they say in, in the United States, I was born, I wasn't born in Texas, but I got there as soon as I could. When I was about two, year old, two years old, we moved down there. I grew up a cradle Catholic. My mother was always especially devoted to Our Lady, thanks to her mother. Uh, I went to Catholic school, uh, St. Peter and Paul, and then Catholic high school, St. Anthony's. And at the end of my 18 years there in Texas, I um, moved on to Boston College. At Boston College, I received a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Arts in Philosophy. After that time, I was uh, approached by a rector of a seminary um, in Nairobi, Kenya. They needed teachers, and he asked me to spend some time down in Kenya helping them train young men for the priesthood. It's funny, because when I got there, he, he actually ran a, the a theology school, and the theology school actually didn't need philosophers. So I went over to a smaller seminary, St. Joseph's Seminary, out of the Diocese of Meru, but still in Nairobi town, and I helped them teach their philosophy programs. Now, a funny turn of events, and Providence always provides in this way, 
is uh, very soon after my arrival, there was some political discord between uh, an Islamic community and a Catholic community in the north of Kenya. Now that was where those uh, that was where actually the philosophy school for the for the national for the Episcopal Conference of Kenya was located, and they had to, in a rather uh, hasty way, move all of the seminarians down into Nairobi. So now they had a bunch of philosophers with no philosophy professor. So I had the good fortune of then going over to both of those seminaries and helping them craft their philosophy program, teaching students, raising money for the poor, uh, and and just living amongst the, the beautiful community uh, found in Kenya. Now it was at that time I started discerning whether I might have a vocation to the priesthood. So I reached out to my local, uh, or my archdiocese in the United States, San Antonio. At the time, Archbishop Jose Gomez was, uh, was the archbishop of the diocese, and I reached out and I explained to him that I had been working in Kenya for the church and I had perhaps been discerning a, a, a vocation to the priesthood. So he sent me uh, to Rome. To, he accepted me into the seminary. I already had uh, several years of advanced philosophy study and experience teaching. And so he sent me to Rome uh, to study at the North American College uh, on the Janiculum Hill. I studied at the University of St. Uh, St. Thomas, which is also known as the Angelicum. And there I received an S a baccalaureate in sacred theology. Now, in the course of those studies, I was actually in the Holy Land, which is a, um, is a very prominent part of this story, and I was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I was praying uh, profoundly about uh, what God might have me do, and it was there that I realized he was not calling me to the, to the priesthood. He had called me to the seminary to sort of orient myself correctly, but he wasn't calling me to the priesthood. So I actually left the seminary and stayed in Rome to finish my, my theology degree, and while I was studying there in Rome, I met who was going to be my future wife. She was an American out of New York, Mariana, my darling. She was working and studying, uh, you know, in Rome. She was getting her theology degree. She was working in the Vatican um, under Cardinal Shoka. And we, we met, we fell in love. Uh, I proposed to her after a year of dating. And at that time, she was still working on a, on a master's degree in theology from the Angelicum. But I had been accepted to per begin my doctoral studies in philosophy at Catholic University of America. So she stayed in Rome f during the bulk of our uh, engagement while I worked on my doctoral, uh, my doctoral program. She set up from, from Rome, she set up our marriage. We actually got married in St. Peter's Basilica at the altar of the Immaculate Conception. Um, it was a very special event. We brought our family over. After, after the wedding, we spent some time in Rome together, and then we moved all of our things back to Washington, D.C., where I continued my studies, and when finished with my coursework, I was offered a job in New York at the Seminary of the Immaculate Conception in Long Island for the Diocese of Rockville Center. Now, I was offered the job as the academic dean, but it was uh, with the awareness that one of my roles there was to combine the seminaries, uh, where the three bishops of Brooklyn, uh, New York, and Rockville Center had decided to aggregate their three seminaries uh, under one name, St. Joseph's Seminary and Yonkers. So I worked uh, to realize that end, and then I became the associate dean uh, in charge of the Long Island and the Brooklyn campuses. I stayed there for almost five years, after which uh, after which I moved to Texas. I took, I, I decided to take a step back from academia. So I considered a bit of my, my Jonah moment. And I took a job at an artificial intelligence company. Uh, and people often question, how can a philosopher work in artificial intelligence? But it's quite, uh, actually quite common nowadays that liberal arts majors are being hired by very specified industries, finance, uh, computers. And the reason for that, I think, is coined perfectly in what the CEO told me when I took the job. It is far easier to teach philosophers how to program than to teach programmers how to think. And I met many clients in that industry who indicated that some of their best performers were, were those people who hadn't ever been officially trained in their field, but who had studied and been educated in the liberal arts. Now, I worked for, several year, for two years in the artificial intelligence industry, and then I realized that my gifts were found in teaching. And I loved, uh, I loved to help bring education back to what it was. And then I discovered Our Lady Seat of Wisdom. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom 
uh, is the kind of educational institution that educational institutions used to all be. It's focused on human flourishing. It uh, is dedicated to Our Lady and to the Church and to the wisdom found in the history of Western civilization. Um, it's, it roots itself on Eucharistic adoration and on prayer and on dedication to encountering God through education, recognizing that the world that we live in, God provided for us to know. And as we get to know it and get to know what it is to be a human being through the studies of philosophy, theology, literature, history, uh, the fine arts and music, we discover more about God. And this is exactly the kind of college that I, that I wanted to, to work for. Uh, we did, uh, I am taking the place of Dr. Cassidy, who had brought it up to where it is now, and we're looking excitedly forward to the future. So, why would a parent like to send their yeah. child, teenager, sure. young adult, right. or maybe perhaps a mature adult, yeah. why would they like to come to Our Lady yeah. Seat of Wisdom? Well, there are many reasons to come here. Um, and the first one is the quality of education. As I've said, uh, one of the things I learned when I was in Kenya, uh, and there was immense poverty in Kenya, was that when people recognize that they have to share in order to succeed, there's a wealth of charity and flourishing. The Kenyans were some of the happiest people I've ever met, and the most beautiful people I've ever met, really. Smiling, laughing, singing, dancing, and they didn't have a tenth of what Western civilization has. Um, and I find that here, uh, that is, uh, we've adapted or adopted that kind of vision, right? Our faculty members intentionally take very low salaries in order to maintain the low price for the college, and the result of that is they cultivate constantly charity in what they do, right? They, they recognize that education and human flourishing is something that ought to be given freely and ought to have sacrifices accompanied with it. So the first thing is the quality of education because the education is fueled by charity for others and it is performed by excellent and competent professors. So what we teach here, and I, I say this as a catchphrase all the time, we do not teach your child to do one thing. We do not teach students to do one thing. We don't train them to do one thing. What we do is we educate them so that they can succeed in all, uh, succeed in all things. Um, one of the salient features of all of our students is that when they leave here, they're mature adults who understand not only how to understand the world, but their place in it. We find that they tend to hold jobs uh, much longer than other students, that they're considered a value added to the company dis uh, even despite what they happen to do in particular. They provide insight in meetings, they provide uh, happy work environments, they work well with colleagues, and in addition, whatever they happen to do, they do with vigor and creativity and innovation. I remember working in AI, we dealed with, uh, dealt with some very large financial corporations, and one of them had sent one of their managers to us to train us so we could train the AI unit, and he made a very interesting comment to me. He said, he was a financial analyst dealing with millions of dollars every day, and he said, my two best analysts, they've only been working for us for a few years and they already have their own teams, have not been trained in finance. One has a degree in philosophy and the other a degree in literature, and there's just something about having been trained in this way, he said, and he didn't understand the difference between education and training, there is something about what they do. They can see connections that other people can't. And that's really the point of an education. The point of an education is not to train you to do anything. The point of an education is to educate you so you can do anything. It doesn't mean you'll be good at everything, but it means that when you're educated, you become an adult. You recognize the interconnections of all things, and you're able to innovate when you're surprised by any circumstance. So the, the way education used to go is that you'd get 90 hours of the liberal arts that would train you, uh, not train you, would educate you, would, would help you become sort of a wise human who can see uh, connections between fields of study, who can recognize the difference between some sort of task you have to do and the ethics of doing that task. Some people combine those now. And then afterwards, they would go on to train in some particular field. Well, in the West, the idea came up that, well, wow, uh, what if we added a fourth year that let them train? 
So now you get things like Bachelor of Arts in Accounting, right? And what that means is you've done 90 credits in the humanities and broad education, and then you've done 30 for accounting. What happened was those people getting educated and having that particular training started becoming uh, very successful in a material sense. They got jobs that paid well, they tended to uh, succeed in things that they did, and people misidentified that success with whatever they were trained in. So now you have bachelors of arts that focus on accounting, let's say, and that's the only value, those 30 credits in accounting. And so you see a decline in liberal arts, not only in quantity, but in quality, right? So these programs uh, that run philosophy schools that only focus on logic or the uh, literature that is sort of intentionally excluding Western civilization just on some social principle, what happens is, is none of the benefits of the liberal education that was supposed to inform that training come along with the degrees. And you're finding now people who, who get these four-year degrees are paying lots of money. They kind of know what they're doing and what they've been trained in, but they don't have the background education to make that training effective. And indeed, we see in the, in the culture at large, uh, there are weekly, I get email invites to conferences trying to help managers understand how to manage people that have been educated in this way or trained in this way. When you step back and look at Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, we begin at the beginning. We talk about Western history, uh, Western civilization, the history of it. We have courses on Eastern civilization. We compare, we contrast, we read classic works of literature, we study the great minds in philosophy, and we also study, very importantly, theology. Now, one of the things that this school in particular takes very seriously, obviously, is the question of God. Though we are Catholic and we appeal to all of the magisterial doctor, uh, doctrines of the Church, we align with, uh, with uh, the papacy, we do the oath of fidelity every year. One thing that I like to tell people regarding the, the study of theology is that the question of God is important. Um, whatever the answer, is there a God or is there not a God, if you think that that question is unimportant, you're incredibly misguided, right? Of course, it matters in everything. And so the point is, is we are Catholic and we study theology according to the Catholic tenets, but the reason theology is, is a very valuable subject is the question of God matters, and we take it very seriously. So we educate our students in how God has revealed himself through history, uh, through sciences, through arts, and in the Catholic faith in particular through the sacraments. So, thank you for that. Perhaps you could also tell us about homeschoolers. Yep. Does Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College accept homeschoolers? Oh, absolutely. In fact, some of our uh, one of our biggest communities here comes out of the homeschool. I do uh, want to, well, I can talk about this while talking about the homeschooling. One of the, um, you know, this school was founded by many homeschoolers, and so they wanted to show respect for the parents as the primary educators, and most parents are very good at educating their, their, their young people. In fact, the vast majority of homeschoolers tend to be uh, far more advanced than those who have gone through more traditional school. That's not to say more traditional schools aren't successful, um, just uh, since homeschooling has that dynamic ability to adapt to the individual student, they tended to be able to advance according to the student's gifts and abilities. So uh, we have a, a very large homeschooling community. Our faculty themselves homeschool. Mo most of our faculty homeschool their, their, their own children. And they're very sensitive to some of the challenges that families and homeschooling uh, students can have. Uh, one of those challenges um, is financial. So one other feature, I mean another very prominent feature for sending um, students to this school is that our tuition uh, bar none is a third or three times lower than any other Catholic school in America. Now in Canada they have a lot of government funding and so we are in parity with other universities but in the United States uh, and I want to explain this to your viewers in the United States because of the federal loan programs for education at, at higher uh, at, at universities um, we see a trend that uh, tuition and the cost of college has exceeded the growth of inflation almost every year for the last 20 or 30 years. Now what that means is that prices are arbitrarily inflating and the reason for that is that students are able to take out loans. Now there are many good Catholic schools in the United States that want to keep their prices down. The problem is they work in a market with other schools that don't want to do that. And so no matter, no matter how they try and can cut costs, 
they find it very difficult. Now, we don't have that problem here. So our tuition, room and board per year, in American currency, is right at $10,000. 10000 American gets you full room and full board and your tuition here. There's, there's, not, a, there's not a comparable price um, in all of the United States. And also for Canadian students, they can now receive funding from the government. That's correct. So just recently, we we are able. Uh, Canada and Ontario has this uh, has a financial aid program for for students. So basically, the government gives a certain amount of money, some as grants, some as loans. And so we've received that. And so our Canadian students are easily reimbursed for their their college education and we found that to be a very helpful so this is one of the ways uh, keeping this in mind we wanted this so that we can keep education costs down we we cut as much as we can uh, but this is a real important reason I think to come to this school wonderful now you mentioned the oath of mad to the magisterium yes. perhaps you can tell us a little about how our lady seat of wisdom helps their students stay faithful to the Holy Magisterium of the Catholic Church and to our Holy Father, Pope Francis. Yeah. Well, one of the most important parts of staying faithful to the Church is prayer and, uh, and participating in liturgy. So uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have uh, daily Mass, we have several chaplains on campus that can hear confession, we do Eucharistic adoration, we have pilgrimages, um, we have prayer groups, we have student-run organizations that help uh, study, we have professor nights where we talk about various saints and various states of life. So I, I want to say first, one of the ways is we stay close to the church, and we stay close to the church because we stay close to God. And the other way is we actually have mandatory, by mandatory, not in a sort of, uh, one of the core components of our program is teaching our students, we have a class on the continuity of the faith through the ages, on the magisterial and the magisterial teaching of the church. So once the students see that uh, the church has indeed spoken to all these major issues in education for years and uh, for centuries and millennia, so we constantly read the new encyclicals coming from the Pope. We have workshops and conferences on them. We have classes dedicated to the papacy, classes dedicated to the magisterium. And then, of course, the Oath of Fidelity is recited every year by our faculty. And what this oath does is it commits our entire educational environment to keeping it within the Catholic Church. Now, what's a very interesting feature is a lot of people see this as limiting. But what they don't realize that true academic freedom comes from knowing where yes is yes and no is no. So often people will say that if you have to submit to some particular doctrinal stance, then you're not free to investigate. But what the truth is with regard to being faithful to magisterial teaching is it allows you to ask any question without fear of going down the wrong path. For example, if you study and ask a question about something that leads you to a conclusion that through faith we know can't be right, we're safe. We don't have to follow that conclusion. We can trust that we've made a mistake somewhere. It gives us freedom to explore every avenue, precisely because God has, in His providence, provided us a safety net. A safety net that makes us, we don't have to conclude that it's okay to kill human beings because they're no longer useful to society. We know that's wrong. Even if practical arguments seem to make sense, we know they can't really make sense. So this is um, a very important part of what we are here, is helping students see the truth and the wisdom through the eyes of the church. Wonderful. Another question that's come up in the media, mm. especially in Canada, and in the U.S. too, yeah. is racism. Right. Now, having worked in Kenya, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've confronted that. So it's a wonderful opportunity to bring your experiences here. How do you as an institution propose to tackle this topic? So racism is one of those, um, obviously, it's a very ugly feature that's been around the world since the beginning of time. Uh, the key, the key to fighting so many human ills, uh, racism being one of them and, and one of the chief ways that we operate here, is we value human life. We focus on the dignity of every human being uh, such that the issue of race is almost 
non-existent. It's not to say that the issue of cultural differences is non-existent, but we, through our education, through all of the prayer and all of the activities we do with one another, there has not been issues of racism at this school. Um, and it's not because we haven't had to struggle and learn how to be human beings, but what we do is when you realize the dignity given to every human being, and, and that's what we focus on here, through philosophy and anthropology, theology and history and literature, uh, through music and art, we realize that this special feature of being a human is the most salient feature of all relationships. We almost, uh, we don't notice other races. And I think um, this is one of those peculiar things where, where theory really begets practice. Because theoretically what I say is very true. But when we start hearing it and living it and it informs our actions, we see the benefits of this. Um, we do have talks on what racism can appear, how it can, how it can show up in activities, how it can inadvertently slip up. We're in a very small community right here. Uh, it's not what the, the modern mind would say is, quote, diverse, which doesn't make it, make it deficient, right? Um, not having, um, uh, many different, let's say, races, and really there's only one human race, that's part of the problem, is that there's only one human race. Um, Nonetheless, given our desire to um, integrate one with the other, our desire to understand what it is to be human, um, we find that this has been a very compelling and powerful response to the racism um, that is considered in the Western world. Yeah. Wonderful. Another issue that's very important to our listeners and our readers is the pro-life issue. Right. How does the Our Lady Seat of Wisdom College address the pro-life issue? Right, so uh, pro-life, it's funny, we have a pro-life group here, and everyone in the college is in it, so it, the, the whole college is a pro-life movement, to be honest. Uh, we, in terms of practical events, we regularly participate in the pro-life marches, we took all of our students to see Unplanned, we, uh, we have discussions about arguments, uh, concerning the pro-life uh, movement uh, because it is very important to understand where people are coming from on this issue. But as I said, getting back to the very issue that we mentioned just before with racism, understanding the dignity of human life, understanding the value of human life, not just, and of course this is the most important source of the value, the Christ, you know, the Christ event, Christ died for every one of our, our unique uh, souls, but recognizing that in the kinds of things that we study, we find the distinctness of human life among all other human lives, right? And we realize that if you look at how the world has been shaped by singular saints born amid a plethora of human lives, you realize that the potential, the potential that every life has to literally change the world, to move mountains with faith, to cure and to discover ways to help ease suffering and bring beauty into the world, there is uh, the question of the dignity of, of human life is a, is a matter of course for our students. What they really focus on doing is trying to share that. And that's another feature. Our pro-life mentality at the school is a, is, a pro, is a mentality that focuses outward. Some people will ask, you know, isn't this sort of a sealed community, uh, you know, sort of hiding from the challenges of the world? And the exact opposite is true. Uh, our students regularly take jobs in difficult environments precisely so that they can witness. And I don't mean witness simply through their joy and love, which they do, but through their arguments, their rhetoric, their presentation of the facts. Um, it's such a trying time right now that our students want to bring the truth of the world so that others can be free. In fact, that is the motto of the school. The truth will set you free. And our students focus on that. They realize that what they're gaining here, they're gaining for the sake of sharing. And the pro-life movement, the dignity of human life for what it is, is at the top of that, of that interest in all of our students. Wonderful. The truth will set you free. Wonderful. Could you also tell us about the faith life of the students here and how that translates into a vocation for them later in life about the church and how the sacraments are involved? Absolutely. Well, one of the interesting things that we train our student to train, we educate our students about vocation. We have a course specifically dedicated to consecrated life and specifically dedicated to different states of life. We broaden 
the, the common concept of vocation to include vocations to marriage, vocations to lay single life, vocations to consecrated religious life, vocations to third orders, uh, vocations of course to the priesthood, uh, both regular and the diocesan priesthood. And prayer is essential in this, right? We have every week, we have a community adoration half hour. It's on Friday this year. Every day, we meet at 3 p.m. Most of the students show up to do um, the, uh, uh, the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Every morning at 9.15, the staff gets together to pray for the college. We have, as I mentioned, chaplains ready to hear confession all to, uh, you know, every day. We have, again, daily Mass. We do pilgrimages. And we, if you look at it, almost every year... Uh, we have not only students that are getting engaged or choosing to have children, but we have at least one student either going and, you know, considering a vocation of the priesthood or to religious life. Now, that might not seem like many. Some colleges will boast six or seven a year, but per capita, it's quite impressive, right? It's one to two percent of our student population considers it. Somebody went last year, somebody went the year before. We have somebody this year considering it. Um, that's 1-2% to 2 of our student body, because we have about 100, anywhere between 100 and 120 students any given year. Uh, this year it's 105, I believe. And so we, um, we generate the kind of openness that allows God to work in the souls of our students. And one of the reasons that is, is because we, we, we educate them about the world. And, and speaking of education, I wanted to mention something about our program. Our program is a three-year degree right now, but we, by next year, should have approval for a Bachelor of Arts in Liberal Arts, which will be a more traditional four-year degree that gives the students an extra year here to study even more deeply matters of faith, matters of morals, philosophy, and literature. So these programs are very, um, very important, and we have many relationships with other schools that give discounts after having studied with us. We have uh, a psychology school down in the United States that is willing to give accept our students immediately and give them a 25% discount. And after a two or three year program, they get a clinical degree in psychology. I know this veers a little bit from, from your question, but the point is, is that our school is ordered to helping students find their place in life, whether it be to religious life, priesthood, marriage, if they have professional interests, if they want to become counselors, if they want to become literature scholars, if they want to become scientists. Uh, I'm going to be instituting a, um, a program to help uh, students have internships in the government and perhaps even in the tech industry. And all of that comes from an openness that's given to us through our prayer life here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. As we come out to conclusion, perhaps I'll give you one last question. Sure. Now, is it possible for mature students, older people, to also join Our Lady Seat of Wisdom? And also, perhaps you could talk to us about your summer institutes. Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, yes, we, we do permit for uh, more mature students to come. There is a limit on uh, an age limit for living in the residences, and that, um, that limit caps out at, I believe, 24 or 25. So anyone older than that would have to secure their own housing. Um, and so, yes, anyone is able to, to receive these degrees. And in fact, this kind of degree is exactly the kind of degree that people can uh, pursue at any stage in life. It's going to fulfill and complete any sort of other training or education they've got because it is an education for the whole human being. We do also run many summer programs, the most prominent one being the Voitiwa Institute, which has been going on for 12 years, started up by the, uh, the famed Cassidy's, or it's going on for 10 years, started up by the Cassidy's, uh, Elizabeth Cassidy, who is the wife of our, our most recent president. And what it, it seeks to do is bring Catholics from all over Canada, especially Ontario, together to 